Yes, welcome to this session. I think the last session before Easter. So I won't be seeing you after two weeks. I hope you have, you, you know, you still have time to check the material and to, you know, in your holidays. You have the YouTube channel, so I guess that's it makes it easy to just see it on the cell phone. I guess that's what I'm sure that that's what you're going to do on the on the Easter. Yeah. So what I want to cover today is just to finish with ESP. So you have an idea more or less how ESP works, more or less what is the design, what is going to happen in the life of the ESP, and what solutions we can make about it. What what can we do about it? And then we're going to talk about, um, in general, about just to summarize, I think we have talked a lot informally, but I think it's important just to summarize what are the production enhancement techniques that we have, and it's usually to prolong the plateau. And then we will start using the already the boost that we have with ESPs. We are going to start a bit about uh, multi-phase compression, okay? Multi-phase boosting and compression. And I'm not sure if we will go so far as to an example with the Snow White case, but we will try. Okay, so ESP, and I want to make kind of a summary, uh, yeah, summary table. So first, the let's talk about the performance, performance curve. Okay, and the performance curve looks like. It's kind of a con concave, a downwards curve, delta P versus Q. And remember that this Q is ac the actual, the local Q at the at the entry of the pump, and it goes like that. Okay, and usually uh, pump manufacturers they don't work with delta P, okay, but they work with head. And I told you that head, H or delta H, also people use it, is delta P divided by the density times the gravitational acceleration. And it has exactly the same behavior. Okay. It's called head. And why people work with head? Because as you can imagine, there are many types of oil, many different densities, many different kind of fluids. So it's very difficult the pump will give different delta P depending on which fluid it is handling. But it all the time will give the same head. Okay, if we normalize, we divide this delta P by the density, then we kind of, it's, it's a way to dimensionalize the, the performance of the pump. Okay, and usually this, this curve is measured, it's, um, you know, it has to do with the, the performance of the pump. I think I have a picture, so please. Yeah, um, usually in the pump we have two processes. One of them is happening in the impeller that we have. Actually, we provide or we increase the kinetic energy of the fluid, okay, by increasing the, the speed. Increase the energy. That happens in the impeller, and that's because we are rotating and the fluid enters through the center. That's a very ugly impeller, but never mind. Okay. The fluid enters through the center and goes through the peripheria, and that change in radius is what increases actually is the energy, the additional energy that you're giving to the to the rotor, to the fluid. Okay. And then you have another process that is happening. You saw that when the, I'm not sh I don't have a picture here, but when the fluid goes out of the rotor, then passes through some other area to reach to the other impeller, okay? That other area works like a diffuser. Okay, that actually is just an expansion channel where we go <coughs> from a very small area to the big area and there, the energy, all of this energy, if we keep it in with a high speed, what will happen is that just we have to increase all the time more and more and more the speed, okay, of the fluid along the pump. And then what happens is that the frictional losses become very, very high, 
and we really don't want that. That's really bad for the efficiency of the machine. So we, what we do is like we increase the speed of the fluid, and then in this diffuser, we convert that kinetic energy to some kind of pressure energy, okay? Just by having this expansion. So in this one, we convert kinetic energy to potential energy, okay? And just by the Bernoulli principle that P1 over plus V1 This is two and this is one. Okay. At the beginning in one, this one is very high and this one is small. But then when you have the expansion, actually what you do is that you increase the pressure and you reduce the velocity. Okay. And then the frictional losses in the next stage will be, will be kind of uh, not so high. Okay. This pump, I this curve is measured for water, okay? There are many types of fluid and many different oils, many different, so people say, okay, just, just measure for water. And it's also measured for one single stage. Okay, actually we don't put the pump completely, uh, but we measure that for a single stage. Uh, anything else to add here? So you have two processes, you have in the impeller and the diffuser, and you have first is giving energy to the fluid by increasing the kinetic energy, and then is converting that kinetic energy to pressure energy. Okay, and that is repeated multiple times. No, it, that's how you calculate H, okay? But it, in your particular case, if you want to find the delta P that the pump is going to give, you take at the rate that you have, you read the delta H, and then do multiply times the density, and that gives you your the delta P. But you have to use the density that the pump is working with. The fluid density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the oil density, okay? For example, if you are operating here, so you go with that rate and read, del and read delta H, Okay, and then with the fluid that you have to calculate the delta P is the density that you're working with that the pump is flowing through and then times delta H. Okay, and that's because in, in, the, in the test we have tested with water and actually what we measure is delta P, then we divide it by the density of the water times the gravitational acceleration and that gives you this, this, cur this curve, okay, delta H versus Q. Uh, and actually, this curve, we can represent it very well by a polynomial, and that's typically what is done, and that's also what we are going to do later in class. Okay. And the polynomial, usually, if you have a lot of points, it doesn't matter, you can use a high order polynomials, like six or, or, yeah. But typically, you try to use uh, from a second order to a fifth order. That's more than enough. Okay, polynomial. And that's very useful because at the end we want to put everything, all of these equations, all of these plots, we could want to put it in some kind of, uh, you know, in Excel or we want to put it in MATLAB or we want to put it in a code. So that's very important. Okay, so uh, so first let's see how that changes, okay, how that curve is modified. Okay, so here we're going to put modifications. Okay, so first, the first modification, very obvious, is by the number of stages. Okay, actually we don't have only, you know, one stage, but actually we have many of them up to, to even, I think, uh, a very hundred stages is uh, kind of a very high number. And the way it works is that you have delta H for one stage, okay? And to calculate for two stages, three stages, for n number of stages, okay? The rate is going to be all the time the same because the rate that passes through one rotor is going to pass through all the rest, okay? Maybe you will have some changes due to the pressure change, okay? Because then the local rate is going to change slightly. 
Uh, but really what is going to change is the delta H. So delta H times N gives you the delta H of, of uh, the pump, okay, of the full ESP. So we can say delta H of a single stage multiplied times the number of stages. That gives you the delta H of the ESP. Okay, so it's like you you pile them up. You have this was for a single stage, then you pile it for two, three, four, five, okay? And depending on what you need, and I told you already there is a limitation in the length that you can have of the pump, the number of rotors that you can put on an axis. There are many things that go there that play a role. So that's not a big issue, and you can just put, if you want to put this, you have the coefficients for a single stage, so you just multiply times n, and then you get for as many stages as you want. Okay. Then the next modification that is important is changes with rotational speed. And actually, uh, here the curve is actually measured at a given speed. <coughs> Typically, the reference speed is 60 hertz. That 60 hertz is 3,600 3, uh, RPM, revolutions per minute. And um, if you increase or decrease the speed, the, the, rotational, freak, the rotational speed, then this curve is going to be scaled up or down. Okay? This is if F goes up, then you're going to be able to give more and more boost. And if you reduce it, you will be get less and less boost. And uh, this F typically has a minimum value. It's limited between two numbers and a maximum. And these values typically are between 30 and 40 hertz. And it's measured in hertz. And why is it measured in hertz? Remember the the, uh, we have an apparatus called VSD, Variable uh, Frequency Converter, Variable Speed Drive, okay? And that one is operating on the frequency of the electrical current. So that's why we, we use it in hertz. And uh, maximum, uh, typically between seven, 60 and 70 hertz, okay? Not more than that. Uh, how do we calculate the performance? I told you that the performance was measured usually for water and usually for one single speed. So what do, how do we calculate for the others? So there is a formula that you say is called, is based on kind of dimensional similarity. And you can say that delta H in one divided by delta H in two, when one, one and two are different frequencies, is given by the ratio between the square of the of the rotational speed and the rate it's equal to f1 divided by f2 okay and that actually tells you that if you have the curve at a certain frequency and you have a point here you can compute the point, an equivalent point in the other curve just by scaling by the frequencies, okay? By the frequency of point one and frequency of point two. That means that in a way these two, they pass through uh, some kind of line like that, okay? So usually they are not measured for different rotational speeds, but they are just scaled by the, by the frequency. And that we can put also on our equation Okay, if we put those, uh, those two things in our equation, in our polynomial that we had from before, and this is number of stages, okay? So you see here we have, in this part, we have scaling the height, the, the head, okay, with the frequency. This, in this case, I'm using the reference frequency is 60 hertz, or it could be also 50, depending on where you are. And you have all the coefficients that you calculated for 60, and then you're scaling the rate. Okay, that the rate is, uh, yeah, because the rate is to the power of four or to the power of three. So when you put that scaling of the rate, actually the F, the ratio between the frequencies are going to have the same exponent, okay? Yes, uh, 
okay? And typically the maximum frequency that it can operate actually is the, the given also by the capacity power capacity of the motor, okay? F max is given of the motor. Um, yeah, I uh, was missing something here. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm... Okay. Okay, then uh, uh, to talk about... Maybe we'll have space here, but... Operational limits. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One. One other comment is if the frequency is kept constant, okay, and then the rate is changing, you all the time have to be on top of a curve, okay. If you want, for example, to reach a point that is in between two frequencies, you have actually to regulate and actually until your pump curve passes exactly through that point okay so but if you're going to be all the time operating at the same frequency that sometimes happen people just leave the pump at a certain frequency so all the time the point is going to fall on top of the line okay if you want to reach a point that is in between you have to find exactly what will be the frequency so your curve passes through that point okay now talking a bit about operational limits Hi, POM, as I told you last class, they have uh, a region, okay, they have two points, a Q mean, a Q max, and a Q mean, where it's recommended to operate. All the time you have to operate between these two, minimum and maximum. And this is wh why? Because one thing is that the efficiency, we plot here on top of the same plot, the efficiency, the hydraulic efficiency of the pump, usually has a behavior Like this, okay, and below these two rates, the the pump the efficiency goes down very quickly. Let's say that this is uh, maybe forty percent and this is seventy percent, okay, and then you have recirculation, you have too many friction losses, you have vibration, you have heating, you have many many problems, and usually we don't want to operate outside of these values, okay. Also, something else that we didn't commented last class is that there is a problem called up thrust and down thrust and that's because the fluid when it passes through the rotor okay it's kind of pushing it and when if you have too much flow it's going to push it too much and the rotor has actually two uh, let me show you I think I have a picture If you see here, that's the rotor. It's this part, this gray, kind of light gray part. And you have fluid flowing through the rotor, okay? And if you have at low speed, okay, then the rotor is very much lying on these supports here, these two supports, okay? It's very much all the weight of the rotor is just lying on these, uh, on these supports. And when it's lying too much all the weight, then it's, when it's rotating, it's just causing a lot of wear. Okay? And that can lead to, if you operate all the time or you operate often at these points below this minimum rate, then you will cause high wear in these supports and then that will affect the life of the pump. Okay, So let's take a screenshot of that. Yeah, I'm going to put it here, but you know it's a continuation of this. Okay, and actually I will have, if I'm operating all the time at a very low rate, I will have, here I will have a, 
X or add it too much weight weight in the that's called the washer okay in the washer area and that leads to failure okay to mechanical failure because that leads to more, more heat more wear friction and then finally failure so that's why we don't want to operate on the left side but then if you operate at a very high rate then the opposite happen actually the rotor has maybe begins to move up and then it's going to touch the upper part and it's going to cause wear on the upper support okay in the upper part in the upper seals so that's also bad and we don't want that so uh, that's called this is called down thrust and the other the other phenomena when it goes up is called up thrust okay it goes and here you see it goes moves up begins to touch this part and when you increase the flow rate very much it's just pressing against this uh, washer and it's causing more and more wear more and more heating and that could cause to reduce life of the pump yeah, I'm going to put that video in the on its learning Okay, that's called up thrust okay. and that leads to wear and heating okay and at the end detrimental for the life so sometimes that's also a limit that we that defines this minimum and maximum rate okay we want to be within that area to achieve certain efficiency to achieve certain but sometimes it's just a problem of up thrust and down thrust okay nothing else uh, and that limit uh, that limit is going to change the up thrust or the q minimum and q maximum change with the rotational speed of the pump okay that means that if here was these two minimum then I will have another two here, then I will have another two here, and they follow almost like a, like a polynom, okay, almost like a parable. By following the relationship that I showed before, Q1 over Q2 equal to F1 over F2. Okay. <clears throat> so that's one limitation that we have to take into account, and also that's why if you see some, some catalogs of pump how it looks like, how the operational envelope looks like. Actually, they have removed everything where we cannot operate. That means the area for when I'm below the minimum frequency, I cannot operate there. The areas where I'm above the maximum frequency, I cannot operate here. And then the areas where I'm exceeding the maximum rate and when I'm below the minimum rate. And if I take all of that away, what I'm left is with something like this. And you see that typically in the manufacturer catalog. Okay, you see that typical shape. I think I have a picture someplace here. I hope. Right here. Okay, and that's what you see, and now you understand where the limits come from. Very important because that. If we are really designing our pump, what, is, what do we have to do? Okay. We have to make that our operational points are going, to follow, are going to fall inside of this area. Everything that we want to operate all the time has to be inside of this area. Okay. And we will see very soon how that looks like in our case that we have done last class. Another limitation, okay, we are going just, you know, these pumps has a lot, have a lot of limitations. So one limitation is the pressure at the suction has to be greater 
or equal that a certain p minimum okay and one of the things is to avoid a gas coming out of solution okay that's one thing and then the other thing is to avoid cavitation What is going to happen is that the pressure, if we make a plot of the pressure, okay, versus x, where x is the kind of the distance along the pump, okay, distance or fluid path Initially, this is the suction pressure, okay, let's say that this is the inlet, and this is, I don't know, the pressure of the discharge of the first stage, okay? And you know that this is going to increase, okay, from the P-suction to the discharge of the first stage, okay, it's going to increase, but in order to get to the rotor, it has first to pass, overcome certain losses along in the, in the, in the passages of the pump. So it's going to go first down and then it's going to go up and increase, okay? And then the issue that we want is that this pressure won't go below the bubble point, below the vaporization pressure of the fluid, okay? This pressure has to be Okay, and that's typically done by uh, something called NPSH, okay, that the pump is giving for each, for each rate, okay, you have an NPSH and for a given certain fluid, okay, NPSH, and that's a value in meters, okay, versus rate, and you see that it's going to increase something like this. That means that if you are having more and more rate, then the pressure losses across the passages of the pump will be more and more important, and then you have this one will go down, okay? We'll have more chance to go below the vaporization pressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Net present, uh, net positive suction pressure. No, net present value, net positive suction pressure. Yeah, and I can show you a video for those of you who haven't seen uh, cavitation, okay? Okay, actually what is done here is you have an electrode and you're releasing an electrical charge just to vaporize the area around the electrode, okay? So that's done, you create the bubble. And then this bubble, if it's close to if then you know the pressure is just at uh, the end the pressure is going to change and it's going to be greater than the bubble point pressure okay so it's going to tend to liquefy again but if it's close to a surface it's close to a wall okay then it's going to heat on the wall and it's going to sh push like a jet of fluid uh, to the wall okay and when this happens all the time you have repetitive action even if it's very small but you have the repetitive action with time then you have that the material of the surface begins to come off and begins to create erosion okay so that's what cavitation is. Let me, I think I have a picture of a rotor with cavitation someplace. Yeah, here. Okay, so where you have this repetitive action, heating all the time, vaporize, uh, li return to liquid phase, and then jet close to the wall, then you have re repetitively, and that causes problems with the integrity of the rotor rotor so we want all the time the pressure at the inlet of the pump to be greater than certain value in our case we put 1.05 but that might be too 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 high too 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 small okay okay so those are all the limitations of the pump so we say q min and q max that they depend on the frequency okay just to summarize we have f min and f max 
exactly. That they depend just by the size of the motor and uh, the specifications of the pump. And also we have that the P at the suction has to be greater than the P of, yeah, we can, um, yeah, than a minimum, okay? That this has to do with vaporization. Vaporization. But all of those, these four are covered if we have just our operational envelope, okay? If we say that the pump, that the point has to fall within that envelope, we are covered, okay? Because this is mi minimum, maximum, and minimum frequency and maximum frequency. But this one really doesn't appear in the envelope because the envelope is representing delta P. So this one we have to put outside with our solver, okay? Like we have done last class. Okay, one last thing, and then we go, we retake the exercise. Also, the performance of the pump is affected by viscosity. You see, why do we use pumps? They are so limited and they have so many problems. Why, why do we use pumps? Of the pump for... Okay. And actually, when we have... Well, actually, the measurements are done for water. Okay. That will be a viscosity of one centipoise. But actually, as we increase the viscosity, then the, 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 the performance is going to decline, okay? This might be for uh, 10 centipoise. This might be for 100 centipoise, okay? So it's going to deteriorate with the viscosity. I think I have a picture here or some. And actually, that's quite a big area of research Okay, I'm going to put here a picture that I forgot to put about cavitation, so let's insert some more space here. Okay, this picture is indicating that you have, when the fluid is just entering into the rotor, then the pressure decreases, and that's where you have this liberation of bubbles and re-liquification re of the bubbles, okay? That picture is not so nice, but uh, you see that you have also the pieces of the rotor coming up. Okay, so that's a measurement, and here you have for one centipoise, and you have for 60, and you have for 270, and that's very important to see how that's going to affect because actually we are very seldom working with a very light fluid, with a very non viscous fluid. We are usually working with very, with fluids with more than five centipoise or more than two centipoise viscosity. So we want to see how that affects. And actually there is a bit disagreement in the community, what works and what doesn't work. But what is used so far, if you don't have anything else, you use the Hydraulic Institute correction method that I have programmed for you in the Excel, okay? And you use that, me that method to correct for the, if you have the water performance, how do you calculate the performance for any other viscosity? And if you don't have anything else, that's what you use. Usually, if you have a very uncertain case, you want to um, you want to do measurements. Okay. Uh, so now let's go to our case. Uh, I published the Excel file on its learning, so all of you can have access to it. And we remember we didn't take into account yet the envelope of the pump. We just said, okay, we have a maximum motor of 600 horsepowers. Um, uh, power capacity, then we said that the pressure at the suction had to be greater than 31.5, okay? Uh, and I think we had nothing else, right? Okay, so the points, how the points go with time? And this is a plot that we failed to do last time. Like that, do you agree, all of you? So now we go back to the class example. Okay, and here we have done only two things. The power has to be less equal than 600 horsepowers, HP, and also that the pressure at the suction has to be greater or equal than 31.5 bar, okay? Nothing else. 
And we have a, already an intuition that we might be violating because we have many other constraints, especially on this square, on this area. So that's what we want to verify now, when, when we have a pump, okay? So if you have these points, what happened here? This was able to deliver, these two were okay, right? We were able to deliver the rate that reservoir people wanted, that was 1,700. This is cubic meter per day. Remember, we are making the assumption that the local and the standard rates are the same. That is, you know, it's just a simplification. What happened in this point? The third reservoir pressure? Do you remember? The power, okay, we get to the power at this point, we hit the power limitation, the power constraint. Okay. And in this point, what happened? We hit both the power constraint and the minimum pressure suction pressure, right? If we go back to our data, for the third point, we reached 600, but still the suction pressure was okay. But then on the fourth point, we also hit that the suction pressure was not okay. So we had to reduce further the rate. Okay, so this is rate reduction. U2, power constraint. And here we had another rate reduction. U2, power constraint. and also to P suction, right? And then we go to the last point, and what was the problem in the last point? Actually, the power was very okay, but then the suction pressure had to be, you know, that was the problem, the limitation. So I had to reduce the rate even further. So this is, uh, here I had to make a rate reduction due to P suction, okay? So now, I go to my, now how do I, this is what the reservoir people want, and this is what I propose using as minimum input from the pump as possible, okay? So now what I will try to find, or what would I do in an ideal situation, will say I will try to find a pump envelope that does something like this, okay? That exactly every operating point in time is going to fall inside of my, of my pump envelope, okay? Find a pump envelope such as all points fall in inside the area. The we say the feasible area. Okay? And of course if we are doing an analysis on a period of forty years it doesn't make sense, okay, because we will have to change pump every five years. So we have to do this, actually, maybe every five years will be appropriate. And remember also something very important. You had one line, this was the maximum and the minimum line, but you have also one that was the best efficiency line that we discussed last class, okay. It's the point where the flow in goes with a velocity that is exactly the angle that the wing, that the blades are, have, okay. So we want also that the points will be as close as possible to this best efficiency line. Yes? So the, for when you will be plugging these points and calculating these points, so the reservoir pressure you will put, or you, you will use to calculate these points, should mm -hmm. be of this five year? Yeah, for example, for the five year period or 10 year period, okay? Okay, and the pump that you will be selecting? Or you can plot every point, okay? So then you have something like that. But then you want to make one analysis for this group of points, one analysis for this group of points, okay? And, and the pump that you will be selecting, it should have a maximum power of 650. Yeah, that I gave you because um, that's because of the size of the casing and the money but that we were willing to spend on this pump, okay? But if you show, for example, that with a bigger pump, you will get much bigger rate or you will get much extended operational region, then your management can say, okay, we want to go, f we want to pay for a bigger pump, okay? Or we want to do something to install a bigger pump, a bigger uh, a motor on my, of, of my pump, okay? So, so this envelope depends, also depends on the power of the pump? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So now I have the pump that was selected. It's already here. So let me just give you a brief explanation with what I have shown you. Um, okay, so here the emotion you have seen already last class, the emotion behavior. We are still not looking into that. We are just assuming that it's pure oil. Uh, then here it's, I took from the, from the catalog, I took the, the, for one single stage and for water, I took all the points and I put a trend line of a polynomial of order four, okay? To calculate the coefficients that we need for calculation for the, for the, you know, for our equation. So let me do that. So these are single stage for water, but it's actually the pump that they selected to run these wells. And now we are going to see if they made a good decision or not. It's not good to be evaluating the, the companies in class, I think. Okay, so this curve is for water. That's the actual pump that they are going to use. And this is for a single stage. Uh, and here I'm getting just, I did the, put the collection of points at a trend line, right click at a trend line, and I got these coefficients that are a, f a four, a three, a two, a one, and a zero, okay? The ones that the polynomial needed to, I needed to compute. Yeah, it's already three. I wanted now in the break, if we can take later a 10 minute break, but I want, if you can come to the lab, I want to show you there's some equipment, okay? So if you use part of your break to go there and then we can have maybe eight minutes break, something like that, that's okay? Yeah, so just don't stand up. i just going to pause the recording. Yes. So let's see again the, the Excel sheet. What else do we have? Uh, so that, that's how I got the, um, that's how I got the coefficients. Okay, I took one single stage well, for water and for um, for 60 hertz, okay, and I got the coefficients, say a four, three, two, one, and zero, okay, that I'm going to use. Then I said the pump that they decided to use, that I didn't control, okay, I'm just kind of now quality control, uh, just checking if that pump works, but we are not here really choosing that's kind of a different uh, topic choosing the pump the actual pump but they chose this pump for us and what i have done here you have the coefficients that i calculated the number of stages it's 78 uh, different frequencies we're going to operate between 60 and 30 and uh, here you have the best efficiency point for one frequency and you have the minimum and maximum rate for also for one frequency so if you see, I have put all of that together, and this is the plot that I get. Okay, you can have you have access to all equations, you, so you can go on cur curious around. Okay. So that's for seventy-eight stages. That's for water. Okay, still for water. Seventy-eight stages. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, and that's all. And that's for 60 to 30 hertz. This is 60 hertz maximum, and this is 30 hertz. And this is the minimum rate line, okay? Remember that it changes according to the frequency. This is the maximum rate line, and this is the best efficiency line, okay? I, not, I need only one point in each line, and actually that's what I have. And then the others I can calculate just by this ratio between the frequencies, okay? Q1, Q2 equal to F1, F2. And you ha can have access to the equations and everything. And the area, so the area, the operational area is going to be like that, okay? Now there is one more thing. So we have changes with frequency. We have the operational limits. But what else do we need? We are working with a fluid of 100 centipoids. So we need correction due to viscosity. Yes? Uh, I guess you're uh, not very interested in defining Q minimum and Q max. I have? Yeah, well, because we have two rates in the So Q minimum should be the right line. Oh, yeah, that's correct. Q min and Q max. Okay. 
That's very correct. So now I need is the correction due to viscosity, and for that I program for you the the hydraulic institute. And you know, remember that if the water cut changes, okay, we are probably it, the the density the viscosity is also going to change. So every reservoir pressure we have a different curve. But for now we are saying okay, everything has the same. I'm just pumping oil, so I don't have to worry about it. And uh, here you have. I have done the correction due to viscosity in this sheet where I have to provide the viscosity and I have to make the corrections using the method of the hydraulic institute. I have done the corrections to the best efficiency point, to the minimum rate, maximum rate, and also to the curve of the pump. And this is this plot here. Okay. And actually you have here the original point operating with water and the, the curve operating with the viscous fluid. Okay, a lot of changes, <coughs> but uh, that's how it works. What is it? Okay, curves, performance curves, corrected by a viscosity that in that case, our case was 100 centipoise. And this is the original curve, the curve in uh, just full dots, okay? That's the original curve, and this is the curve corrected by viscosity. So at the end, the operational area is going to be like that, okay? And remember, if the viscosity changes, we're going to have a different plot for every year. So that makes kind of uh, the, this visual method not so, not so nice, okay? So what are we going to do now? I'm going to plot the points on top of this uh, drawing. Okay, we have 1700, so it should be someplace here. Okay, and we're going to see how the, if they fall or not inside the area, and which frequencies do we need to put in every year with this pump that someone selected for us. Okay, that is the actual pump that they are using in uh, Peregrine. So let's plot that. So here we right-click, uh, select data. Okay, actually I have a series here called current point. And here I'm going to plot this. And, okay, remember this plot is given in uh, delta H, okay? And I have delta P, but uh, that's why you have a space here in your Excel table in to calculate delta H, to be able to plot it in the... So it's this divided by the density. Density times 9.81. Okay, but remember, this should be in Pascals. Okay, let's see. Okay, and now you have your, your five points. So what is our conclusion? That pump was properly sized or not? Huh? We have to be careful. We, you know, if someone from Statoil sees this class, they are going to, okay. Actually, it, it is, okay? For these five points, everything falls. What we care is just that it falls within this map, okay? And actually, the last point is falling a bit on the line, on the edge, but it's still inside this operational envelope. Okay, what happens if we do, for example, another point? Do you want to do another point? Yeah? Okay. So let's uh, do another point. Uh, the pressure will go even lower, 145, 25. Actually, it should be steps of 15, I think, right? So why here it was, should be 185? Well, yeah, we are going to try with this one. Uh, okay, so if it's only because of the, of, um, 
yeah, of the of Excel. Okay, what have we done last time? We said please solve resolve change. Huh? Okay, yeah, we have to change that. Seven. And we had uh, what else? Nothing else? So we said solver, solver, please. I want to maximize F22, okay, the total rate coming from the well by changing the total rate, which is kind of not very smart, and keeping this uh, max greater than 31 and less than 600, okay? Yes. You're awake, that's good. I'm not awake, looks like. Okay, correct now? Yeah? My quality control team? Okay. okay, so now I got one more point and I'm going to plot that point and you see it falls outside because that, uh, that approach, that analysis that I was using didn't take into account that the rate has to be greater than a minimum rate. Okay, one question, will I be able to take this point back in or not? if I take that constraint into account. Hmm? If I use, you see here that this is the delta P that I have to have for this rate, okay? Let's say that if I reduce even further the rate, I cannot write here, it's, Okay, so this is for 125 bar, I think. PR equal to 125 bar. So you see, one option will be, okay, the, the rate is too high, okay? And the delta P is too high. So one way will be to reduce the rate, okay? Such as I'm still in the operating range, okay? But remember, the delta P depends that the wellhead pressure has to be exactly seven bar. So when I reduce the rate, actually this point is going to go something like that, but it's probably going to be all the time outside the envelope, okay? No matter what I do, because if I reduce the rate, I'm never going to get a delta P low here, okay? Such low as here to enter back into the envelope, okay? So probably here I have reached already in this point the limit of my ESP. My, my ESP can operate a bit sometime on that part, but really not much because it's going to affect negatively the life of the ESP. So it's not going to work anymore, okay? Now, uh, I, I propose to, uh, okay, so what is the frequency that each point has to have? Now, if we want to give the operator, which frequency do they have to use every year? So how do we do that? So if this one was 45, okay, and this one was 60, we have some curve here in between that is going to be, for example, uh, let's say 45 and 60, what is the half of that? 52, probably, and then you have to increase to 55, for example, and then you have to increase to, I don't know, 56, and then you have to increase to 57, okay? And then you have to start reducing again the frequency. Okay, so you need an adjustment for every year or every six months or every two weeks. You need an, an adjustment. And first it's going to be increasing of the frequency and then it's going to be reduction of the frequency. So if you plot the frequency of this pump one with time, you're going to see something like this, going from 52, going up and then going down. Okay, until at this point, I cannot operate anymore. If I continue operating, I risk reducing the life of the, of the pump very much. That clear? Yeah? Any questions? No? Okay, so this is one way to do it. I didn't take into account the pump only at the end. Okay, I do an approximation, and then I try to see if the points are going to fall within the, the, the operational envelope of the pump or not. 
What is the other approach that I talked about in class before? One approach was to take the element that was causing trouble out and then do the modeling without that element. Okay, and what was the other approach? To take the element, to make a model of the element and then put it inside the, my, my model, okay? So do you want to try that also? Or too much pumping for one day? Yeah, you want to try? Okay. <laughs> so now the second approach is to include the pump model in uh, in my um, hydraulic calculator. Okay. Please note something also that has the wellhead pressure. Yes, just um, just a note apart. Note. P wellhead is less than the bubble point pressure, okay? So probably I'm going to have gas coming out of solution at some part at the discharge of the pump, okay? Or in the, in the tubing. Probably gas coming out of solution at some position in the tubing. Okay, and we are neglecting that. We are just assuming single phase flow. Okay, that's an error that also our calculations have. They will be actually a bit less pressure drop in the last part of the tubing when we reach um, the bubble point pressure. But, okay, just keep that. Uh, we are neglecting this gas. Now I'm going to include the pump model in my hydraulic calculator, and that means adding these coefficients, okay? I, luckily, I already programmed for you. So you have, uh, if you press Alt F11, uh, what I was using to plot the curve of the pump is actually pump head, okay? That's with no viscosity, just, just with the coefficients that come from, from water. And then you have underscore viscous, and that's when you have actually a viscosity and you have to make the correction. And the method from the Hydraulic Institute, the correction method is all of that that is programmed here, okay? That you create a correction factor. Those of you who want to know more about, about it, I can give you the, the standard so you can read and, yeah, and, uh, and learn a bit more. Uh, but if you see here, I have two other functions that are P discharge of the pump, and that's for water, okay? And I'm giving the rate, the frequency, then N is the number of stages, uh, the density, the reference frequency, okay? Because if I'm operating at the frequency different than the reference frequency, I have to do the scaling. Then I have the coefficients 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And if I have the, the viscous, then I need to use just this uh, viscosity function okay so that's what I'm going to use now in the exercise uh, so what I propose is to uh, yeah let me save that and make a copy and we are going to say ESP included And what I propose is to calculate, the way of calculating will be all the time co-current. Okay, I'm going to calculate the available wellhead pressure. So one proposal, calculation proposal. current from bottom hole to wellhead okay I assume a rate or assume a flowing bottom hole pressure then I go all the way up until the wellhead pressure okay <coughs> then I check after that I check is PWH calculated equal to 7 bar if not then I have to adjust I have to try a new rate try new rate and probably I'm going to do that with the solver Okay, or if yes, 
then I have to stop the calculation. Okay. So in that case, I'm not going to do any counter current and co-current. I'm going to do everything co-current. Okay. So let's modify the sheet for, for that. Uh, remember, I'm going to give now for equilibrium, I all the time prefer to use pressure. Okay. We could use rate, but let's, uh, le I, I think I prefer still to use uh, pressure. So this will be the calculated, okay, the rate. And the given will be the flowing bottom hole pressure. Okay, I have just to change that to red. And I those have to be values, so I have to paste and get rid of the formulas here. And now the Q, I have a function called IPR Q, okay, that is going to give the Q. And here it wants the J that has to be blocked. Here it wants the reservoir pressure that's going to change and the well, uh, flowing bottom hole pressure that is also going to change. Okay. Now I move, all of this is going to be the same. I move to the suction that also is going to be the same. Okay. But now I have to go to the discharge and here is where I'm going to use my pump function, my pump uh, equation. So what was the name? You remember? P discharge pump viscous. Okay. P discharge pump viscous. Okay, what do I need here? I'm going to need a lot of things. P in, P suction. Okay, that doesn't go locked. Q, that's total Q through the pump. F, that's the frequency of the pump. So we need a place to put the frequency, okay? So let's do that. Uh, frequency. And which frequency should we put? We said, we from the plot, we said that was going to be like 52 or something, right? So let's try 52, 55, 56, 57. And here it begins to reduce, I think like again 55 52 okay okay so here again p let's see i hope i don't need anything else p discharge of the pump p in q you have to check if i'm doing things correct uh, f the number of stages that's here someplace i think here and that has to be blocked okay then the density that's here then the reference frequency that's actually in my yeah in this plot the reference frequency and that also has to be blocked the viscosity it's given by every reservoir pressure so more things Q at the best efficiency point for the reference frequency. I also have that value here. Q at 60, right? So I block it also. Then I have the coefficients. I also have them in this sheet. So uh, coefficient A5, 4. Okay, this one should be blocked, okay? Three, two, one. A long, long number of arguments. Okay. Two and one. Okay, and it gives me one hundred and eighty-six bar discharge pressure. That sounds. If I'm coming in with, uh, okay, I'm coming in with seventy-six and 187 so that means like 110 bar that sounds reasonable is what i had from before okay so i have p discharge then uh this part i can leave it here from now the delta h i can leave it also here for now and i want to calculate now this is given okay wellhead pressure given and i have to calculate p wellhead pressure calculated okay
calculate it and here I need P out okay P out P out is uh, the rate it's getting boring the ID is this D2 I lock it then density is this value here viscosity here and length is um, H2 lock it theta was 90 degrees is a vertical completion we're assuming then P in it's um, the P discharge here right and the roughness okay and 8.55 okay very close to 7 but not exactly 7 so if we want it to be 7 what do we use solver solver please our big friend you have to help us to to get exactly 7 okay well, and wow here I got 7 Oh, I didn't change this. Okay. Okay. Should I create a um, should I create a error cell? Yeah. Or should we just use send to a value? Let's see if it works. I'm not sure if it will work, but let's see. Okay, so these are also calculated. We put them in blue. And we go one by one, year by year. So what are what are we going to do here? We want to take Okay, so here we are kind of an, uh, in an issue, okay? This pressure has to be 7. The rate has to be 1700, okay? And what else? suction has to be greater than 31.5 and it's kind of too many constraints right so how do we put you know before we were using mean you know sending exactly this cell to 7 right so how do we do that if now we want also to get the rate equal to 7 1700 Let's see, let's try, let's try this approach, okay? We want to, again, the same thing, maximize this rate, right? Okay. By changing, what are we going to change? Flowing bottom hole pressure, right? And we want to change also the frequency, okay? Right? Now, I want that the suction pressure will be all the time greater than, this is 17, right? 31.5. I want that the power will be, yeah, I don't need this constraint anymore because I already have the curve of the pump, okay? I know what the pump can deliver, so I don't need this constraint. Uh, what else do I need? The rate should be less than 1700, right? I don't want, if I could produce more at the beginning, I don't want to produce more. Uh, that's my limit. That's what I want to produce. And what else? Hmm? Yeah, the frequency should be should be less equal than 60. And the frequencies should also be less equal than, uh, greater equal than 30. Okay, what else? Okay, we haven't calculated that here. So that's something that we have missing. The minimum and the maximum for that frequency. Okay, let's close. Yeah, we know it's not going to be a problem for that point. Let's put it for the next, for the next pressure. What else do we need? Change the flowing bottom hole pressure and the frequency to maximize rate, but the rate has to be less than 1700. The pressure has to be greater than 31. The frequency has to be less than 60 and the frequency has to be greater than 30. And we are missing one thing. We wellhead pressure. Wellhead pressure has to be exactly seven. Okay, too many constraints. So um, I wonder if it's going to crash. 
You know, solar is magic, but it's not like it can do everything. Huh? So we try solve. Wow. Okay. It solved and it found exactly. Actually, our guess was very good. Okay, because actually we were cheating. We did it from the from visually. Okay, but fifty-seven point seventy-seven. That's exactly the frequency that I need to produce that. Okay. So let's take a snapshot of the solver. I think it's important to, um, and that's actually what the programs, all of these gap and pipe sim, what they are doing is they are solving a problem like that. Okay, when you give the constraints, you try to maximize production. They, that's that's what they are doing. Okay, so let's make a comment here on that. Uh, so here I'm maximizing liquid rate by changing this is PWF and this is frequency of the pump and I'm saying that the rate has to be less equal than 1700 then the suction pressure has to be greater or equal than 31.5 bar then the frequency has to be between 30 and 60 and also that the wellhead pressure, I want it to be exactly 7 bar, okay? And this last condition is really the hydraulic equilibrium, if you think about it, okay? Now, what happens, I'm going to ask you, what happens if I operate, if I want to solve now for another frequency? I know that's what I need, okay? And that's how I, I pose my problem. Now I say I want to see how much I will produce if I produce to 60 hertz. Okay, how do I find the equilibrium in that case? Okay, so I just put here 60. That's going to be fixed. It's no longer going to be a solver variable. And then I just use the solver to say, solver, solver, please take this value to seven, okay? By changing flowing bottom hole pressure then I don't have any constraint on the rate, doesn't make sense. Suction pressure also doesn't make sense, okay? Frequency don't make sense because I'm not changing it. Okay? Just like that? I think so. Okay? And here I calculate that for 60 hertz, I will be producing exactly 200 and, uh, 2, 2100 standard cubic meter per day. Yeah, and the piece suction is still above the 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 vapor, the bubble point pressure. Yeah, do you see the difference between the two cases? Yeah, yes. Uh, about the so mm -hmm. when I change the frequency, the bubble uh, point pressure is going to change. Mm -hmm. If you change the frequency, you will get a different wellhead pressure. No, we put okay. all the constraints except to change the zero like Yeah, you have to you have to change because that's a value that I'm giving. That's value that I'm guessing. If I leave it don't change, then it will it will never converge because it doesn't have enough variables to to find a solution. Okay. okay? Because if you fix well flowing bottom hole pressure, you're fixing the rate. And when you change the frequency of the well, the frequency of the pump, actually, you should also change the rate. Okay? Yes? How about the pump power? The pump power still holds, but what we should have done here that I didn't do was to make a polynom for the efficiency and then to calculate the efficiency for each rate. Okay? If you remember from that we mentioned at the beginning of the class, that the efficiency versus rate was a behavior something like that, okay? So you can actually, with this collection of points, you can create a polynom for the efficiency, A4, Q4, plus A3, Q3, etc. And then you can calculate the efficiency for each for each rate, okay? And that's the efficiency that you use to calculate the, the power consumption, okay? But we are not, yeah, that's already too many things for you in, in one class. So that's for uh, finding, these approaches for finding, finding uh, F to get a certain rate 
and honoring the constraints, okay? Operational constraints. A uh, very high value will be more than 100, but uh, 70, 60, 50, that's something that is typical. Okay. So that's this case, okay, case one. And then the other solver that I set up was case two. In that case, I'm just fixing frequency and then find the rate, the equilibrium rate. Okay, remember this last constraint is very important because this is actually what closes, this closes the hydraulic equilibrium. Okay. Okay, fixing F, find equilibrium rate, find. Okay, so that's a uh, wellhead pressure. I force it to be exactly seven bar. And by changing the flowing bottom hole pressure. So I'm actually trying to find the equilibrium at that particular frequency. If I'm fixing 60, I'm trying to find. And actually the map, maybe the map we have it from before, uh, how it's going to look like. The point is going to be exactly at 60 Hertz. Okay, the point is going to be exactly at that point. Okay, uh, so we take a break, 10 minutes. We continue, let's check the, uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, if you, you know, we should have noticed something before, something was wrong in the 600 horsepower, okay? How can you say from watching from watching just this plot that something was wrong on the 600 horsepower limit? We said that this point it's already on the limit of the power. Okay, that's what we said before, if you remember, right? But if we put it on the curve of the pump, you see that still there is some place between that point and the limit of 60 hertz. Okay, so actually I think I made a mistake. I think and the power of the pump should have been a bit higher than 600, maybe 700 and something, I think, okay? And actually you can see it very much from the plot. If you have, if it reached already the maximum power, the point will be exactly over the 60 hertz line, okay? And in this case, it is not. So the power is slightly higher than 600, okay? So I made a mistake there, I maybe, yeah. So you, you just to be aware. But then this point here, the pressure at the suction had to be greater than 31. So I had to reduce the rate anyhow, okay, no matter what. So probably this point can be much higher, okay, can be higher here, but this point is going to be in the same position because the limitation is not on the power, but it's on the suction pressure. Okay, just to summarize, I want to close now the discussion about pump. It's, you know, it's a bit complex because it has not so much because of the yeah, because of the calculations, but because of all the constraints that you have in the pump, okay? You have too many constraints. But that's also very interesting because you have to design for all of these constraints, okay? And I want you to see kind of a visual interpretation and then also how do you do it with, if you have a model, okay? So let's summarize. What we have done, what have we done first, okay? We had the... Without having any pump, okay? Without having any pump, we did 
counter current calculations, co current calculations, and we said I want to produce certain rate. This rate came given by God, okay, by reservoir simulation team or by someone, reservoir engineer. And he said I want to produce exactly that rate. And I computed the delta P that the pump has to provide to to to, to give that rate. Okay. So let's do a how how is that? To um summarizing. Okay, so the first approach was without pump, okay, just taking the pump out of the system, ESP out of the okay, the rate Q of liquid was given by the reservoir engineer or reservoir specialist and then I calculated P discharge are you okay? yeah and calculated P suction okay and I told you well we don't have yet the pump we, do, we know it has to fulfill a lot of criteria but I told you let's use the minimum criteria that it has to fulfill and the minimum criteria is that Q times delta P of the pump over the efficiency has to be less equal than the maximum power of the pump. Okay, pump power. And also that the pressure at the suction has to be greater or equal than some factor times the bubble point pressure because of cavitation, okay, and because just we don't want to get any gas in the pump. Just these two simple okay constraints and here uh, we made a mistake I'm going to put here ops okay we made a mistake the power should have been a bit higher than 600 HP a bit higher not much but I think it should have been a bit higher okay then we use that and then we were ready okay we see okay this is this is what you will be able to produce at some point you have to reduce the rate because either you don't have enough power to produce that rate or because the suction already reached a limit okay so from here we found that rate had to be reduced due to power limitations and suction pressure limitations okay and actually the plot of delta p versus q was something like this one two three and that point should have been in the same rate okay because we still had enough power and then the other points like that and this is the direction of P reservoir decreasing. Okay. Then came someone, okay, we are not in ESP design or in choosing ESP. That's usually a special department in the company. And that usually is done also by service company. But someone said, I have this pump here for you that I want just to verify if it works or not. Then I took the pump and I plotted the operational envelope. I remember for pumps, usually I use delta H and Q. Okay, and this is the pump plot given by the ESP specialist. And what I did just, I put all the points, you know, I did a correction, okay, I had to do a correction by number of stages. I had to do a correction by frequency. I had to do a correction by viscosity. I had to put all of that, okay? And at the end I found this nice area. And what I did, just I plot my points to see if they fall inside of this area. And luckily they fall, okay? So I'm saying, I can say with certainty that your pump, the pump that you chose, is going to fulfill, is going to 
you know, it's going to be good to pump the rates and the operational conditions that I have found, okay? <coughs> the pump can provide the operational conditions that were estimated. Okay, so here I'm happy. Okay, so that finishes the first approach that we have used, okay? And from here also, we could estimate very roughly what will be the change of frequency that we needed, okay? Now comes the second approach. What was the second approach? And that's the approach that most of you will have to use because commercial simulators, here we have a lot of freedom, okay? Because we were able to take away the pump out of the system and do our analysis in a smart way. Commer this approach is what usually is done by the commercial simulators. You already have a pump model built in in your, uh, in your uh, production system. The ESP model, there is an ESP model built in in the production simulator okay <clears throat> so we have to um, okay and in that case what have we done we have to our task was to find F okay the frequency of a certain pump, we already have a model, we have the coefficients, we have everything. Find F such as the rate is equal to 1700, such as the, the P suction is greater than 31.5. Find such as PWH is equal to 7 bar such as the Q is greater than the minimum that that we didn't put, okay, we forgot to add, and is less than the maximum, such as the frequency is greater than 30 and less than 60. And what else? <coughs> Nothing else, I think. Okay. So for that we have to use, we have to use, to use, the solver okay or we had to use an automatic routine that changes frequency and changes bottom hole pressure such as all of these constraints are met you have it because you have here the let, let's do it let's take some time to to do it so here we calculate cumin okay cumin and that's given by um that's in uh, actually it's in these units cubic meter per day and q max Okay, and I have here, I have calculated for you uh, the minimum rate and maximum rate at this viscosity at that frequency, at 60. Okay? I have you can see the details on the formula but I have calculated for you already okay that's minimum and maximum for a viscosity of a hundred centipoids okay so if you want to calculate for another frequency so you have to do if F divided by 60 is equal to Q mean at F divided by one three oh two. Okay. 
and if you want to calculate q max at f then that's going to be f over 60 multiplied times one two three one four okay and you can see how i calculate this is the with the correction of this manual that i gave you okay so let's try that um where is it okay q mean we said that is f <coughs> that is here f okay times the q minimum right at that viscosity divided by i have to block this cell and divided by the reference frequency that is this one okay yeah Okay, 1301, and then the maximum will be the frequency that I have times the maximum rate divided by the, um, the f uh, reference frequency. Okay, now I have my two rates, and now I can add that like a constraint in my solver. Okay? But if you see the rate that I got, the value that I got, 1700, well, actually 2000 here, even this point is between these two. So there is no, no issue. Okay? And I have to drag this for all other frequencies. Okay, uh, so we, um, so that was the other approach, okay? We had to include the model, and then we had to kind of to set up a solver problem to say, please honor all of these constraints, okay? And you will see that it will be able to honor these constraints just like in the previous case, up to these points, okay? But then there will come a point where it won't be able to honor those constraints. No matter what you do, the point will never fall inside the operational map. The point will be unfeasible. And I please tell you, if you have time, or you know, between doing the exercise, maybe when you come back from Easter, I hope you didn't forget everything, but you come and try to repeat the same way, but for all the other years, okay? And you will see that you have that problem. Solver won't find a feasible solution for some years, okay? Because just there is, especially for the last year, okay? It won't be able to find a feasible solution, okay? And these are the two methods. Graphically, it's very easy to see, but really the problem is, if the viscosity changes in years, okay, you have a different map, the region is going to change slightly with time, okay? So let's see, put here, problems with the graphical method. Okay, the pump curves, pump, <coughs> operational envelope, changes with viscosity okay that means that if the water cut increases okay okay that will be for a viscosity one of 100 centipoise but as the water cut increases we have this emulsion behavior okay so what's going to happen is that this is alpha of the water and viscosity of the mixture you have something like that okay and we are currently here, that's at time one. And then at time two, I'm going to be much higher viscosity. And then the map, let's put it in pink or in, then the map is going to look probably something like this. Okay. Right. So that's going to be one complexity. Our points were here, but now for point for time one they were inside, but for time two with the viscosity they are, they are going to be outside. Okay, and then in that case I have to reduce the rate to pull it back into the envelope. Okay, so that's delta H, and that's Q, and that will be for time one, and that will be for time two. Uh, so thus, those are some of the problems with the graphical method, okay? That you, if the envelope changes with the viscosity or with time, then you have these kind of issues. But the problem with 
the uh, the analytical method or the method with the equations it is it might be difficult to find a solution It might be very difficult and for some points it's impossible. You already saw some point that falls outside, it's going to be impossible for that point to find a point in the map. But the solver might try and try and try and take time and at the end it tells you, okay, I didn't find any solution. While if you do it from the graphical way, you might find right away, okay, this point will never come in into the plot, no matter what you do. So I, I should just change the pump. There is no point on doing the simulation there, okay? But the, when you try with the solver, the solver will try, will try, will try, and then it will say, maybe it will give you an error, okay? I didn't find any feasible solution. So these are the two differences between the two approaches, okay? Clear? More or less? Yeah? So before we abandon, any question about the SP? A lot of questions? I think that's the intention. You should have a lot of questions, so you go and do experiments, uh, yeah, clear? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yes. We we are going to let's see if I have time to cover that by the end of the class, okay? We are going to do ESP probably you're not going to get an an uh, exercise, okay? But you have explained, I think, a lot in class. So I think you should have at least the, and with this class exercise, I think if you do this extra, I think you are kind of cover more or less what I expected you to know on ESP. But the exercise that we are going to make is about uh, wet gas comp wet compression, okay? Subsequent compression, actually working with the gas. And with compression is very similar to a multi-phase mixture, okay? It behaves very similar. So there are some things that we can extrapolate to a multi-phase uh, booster or a multi-phase compressor. But, you know, this is an area where there is still a, a lot of research done. Things are not done, are not known very much. So, yeah, maybe Gilberto here, he's doing his PhD in uh, multi-phase boosting. So maybe he will be able in a couple of years to show us something impressive. Okay, so let's talk about, we had a discussion pending on uh, a production ways to prolonging okay ways to prolong the plateau okay we had this con this uh, discussion pending okay so we can do two things basically we can uh, increase the available pressure Sounds very simple, and we will see now what it entrains. Or we can decrease the required pressure. Okay, and that means increase the available pressure at the wellhead. Okay, and decrease the required pressure also at the wellhead. If you remember, in our case of Snow White, we had I think was three wells, and then we had other three wells. And you remember we did counter current calculations all the way to the wellhead and co current calculations from the reservoir up to the wellhead. And then we said if it's positive, we can choke. Okay. Now I want to see what kind of methods I can use to uh, increase to if the plateau originally is going to die here, okay, that's the end of the plateau, how can I prolong that plateau and produce some more? Okay. 
And actually I'm telling you I can increase use methods to increase the, res the available pressure or to decrease the required pressure. So what will be methods to, to increase the available pressure? Okay. And let's go step by step. Okay, let's go first to the formation, then we go to the tubing, and then we go to the rest of the system. Okay. So the first method there in the reservoir is what? To you use pressure support. Methods, okay? That means I want to support or I want to maintain the pressure in the reservoir, okay? Maintain reservoir pressure. And what methods do I have there? All the reservoir people, the experts? Injection of water, okay? Injection of water. Injection of gas, okay? And this is, you know, let's assume that this is kind of a generic case, okay? Not only um, the Snow White, but it can be actually any fuel, oil fuel or gas fuel. But actually we don't want to inject gas in a gas field, okay? That doesn't make much sense. Um, okay, so we have injection, pressure maintenance. What else can we do to keep the pressure so it won't decline so quick? Yeah, basically these two, right? We don't have anything else. Right? Yeah. Okay, what else? Now we move from the reservoir, okay, we move towards the well bore. What else do we have in the way to the well bore? The IPR, okay? It's representing the reservoir deliverability. So we can improve reservoir deliverability. Okay. How do we do that? We have acidizing. At the end, okay, if we take the simple equation, okay, we use this undersaturated equation, PR minus PWF, okay, we are just increasing or we are keeping this J high, okay, so we can get a high rate from this uh, increase the productivity index, okay, or if we are talking about the gas, the back pressure, back pressure um, coefficient, okay, we are increasing. CR, okay? So acid, acidization, acidizing, okay? That means that in the region neighboring to the well bore, okay? We usually, due to the drilling, we have that the formation has been damaged due to the mud. So we inject some acids, we inject some substances to uh, clean the formation and get it back to the way it was initially, okay? Or even improve the productivity. <coughs> Acidizing, injecting chemicals to improve a permeability of a near wellbore region. Okay, and that usually costs money. Okay, all of these also cost money. So in this part, the first method, we were just trying PR don't go down so much, okay? And now in this method, we are trying to get J up. What is another method that we had to, to keep the, to keep the, you know, the reservoir deliverability high? Fracturing, Fracturing okay. And actually, if we have our well bore, okay, and we frack, we kind of increase Okay, the contact area of the well bore with the reservoir. Okay, and we allow for the flow to, to have more flow towards the well bore. Okay. That's also expensive. Okay. And we have also improvement in the completion. Okay. 
that means for example uh, greening uh, side tracks or a multi-branch multilateral wheel okay putting also equipment like you saw today inflow control a valve inflow control device okay uh, yeah uh, for example you can also change the tubing But usually these changes for subsea wells or for offshore wells have to be done pretty much up front. You have to plan already that your completion is not going to be a restriction for the deliverability of your of your well. Okay. Really the, the only change that is done is to drill more laterals in a well. That is the really the only change I think is done in the North Sea. I don't think uh, yeah, other changes are, are done. Okay, uh, now we abandon the formation and we go up. Okay, actually the tubing doesn't go here. But we can change also in the tubing. What can we do in the tubing? Increase the size of the tubing, I already gave you that. Sometimes use if you have to do intervention and you have the casing is big enough to accommodate the bigger tubing, you can do it, but it's also expensive. What else can you do? Install artificial lift. And that means you already know what that is. ESP, gas lift, you can put a rod pump, you can put a, a jet pump, you can... Uh, uh, what else are we missing? Hmm? Progressive, Progressive PCP. Okay, we can. Um, if we are talking about a gas well with liquid, we can use uh, foam sticks, <coughs> plunger lift. Okay, and really, there is not much. I think not else. Not. Yeah, you can also, you can have, uh, if the viscosity is very high, you're pumping a very heavy fluid, you can inject diluent. Okay, that is a low, a high API crude to reduce the viscosity of the formation oil okay the formation oil is very viscous uh, for example if it's more than 100 centipoise this might be used you inject diluent and diluent is just a light oil that is going to mix and it's going to reduce the viscosity of the resulting oil uh, what else can we make yeah I think that's more or less it but we can also increase the number of wells okay By increasing the number of wells and keeping the production fixed, okay, if we have, for example, we have to go from one reservoir to one separator, okay, and we have one, only one well, all of the rate has to pass through that, through that pipe, through that conduit, and it produces a very big pressure drop. Now, if I divide and I split, I put two wells, for example, from PR to P separator, and this is Q divided by two and Q divided by two, I will have less pressure drop because the rate will be less in each well. And now if I have three, okay, then PR Q divided by three, okay, it will be even less. But as you saw, and you had an exercise already on that, usually I not cannot just increase it, you know, the way I want because the wells also cost money, okay? And usually I have number of wells, I have a maximum point, and then it's going to decline, and then maybe even be negative, okay? So I want to choose all the time, we have a no problem delivering the plateau, I want to be all the time in this point. Okay, what else can we make?
we can put here that's not on the well but that's on the uh, seabed what can we put on the seabed we can put for example bigger flow lines right Remember, one big big issue is that if you make, if it's a gas, if, let's put OPS again, OPS, okay, if we have gas and liquid production, if I increase the size, the diameter of the flow line, Okay, probably I will get what? More accumulation, okay? Because the, r the velocity of the gas will be less and then the gas cannot carry the liquid out of the transportation lines. And that's a big issue, we don't want that. So it's not all the time that you just increase the size and it's better, life is better. You have to be careful, okay? You have, if you put a bigger pipe, then you have more accumulation. Bigger pipe, <coughs> then you have less gas speed gas velocity and you have at the end accumulation of liquid okay and then you have because of the accumulation you have more actually more pressure drop than what you intend just because the usually the liquid is carried by the gas okay it's because of the interfacial friction between the gas and the droplets of liquid or the phase of the liquid okay when you make it very big then the velocity of the gas reduces and then this interfacial shear is not enough to carry the the liquid out of the of the tube and then it begins to accumulate it's the same for the tube right the same for the tube mm -hmm. Okay, every time you have gas with some liquid, be careful. Another approach that we can use is, and I'm going to talk a bit about it, is we can use uh, subsea boosting and compression. Okay, really flow lines and pipelines, I can change in some sections, okay, I can make them bigger. If I find out that they are a bottleneck, but if you have a long section of 10 kilometers or 80 kilometers of pipe, for example, the Snow White pipeline, you really don't want to change it for something bigger, okay? Because it's very expensive. What you can put sometimes is also a parallel flow line and pipeline. And that's, I think, actually what they're going to do in Snow White, okay? In Snow White, we have the PLEM, if you remember, P PLEM. And we had one line, and here we had Hammerfest. Okay, they are going to actually to put a parallel line going all the way to Hammerfest at some point to reduce the pressure drop. Remember all the time that the pressure goes down, then the volume, the local volume of gas goes up and if this goes up, the velocity of the gas goes up. And if the velocity of the gas goes up, the friction goes up. So the pressure losses go up, right? It's kind of a chain of events. This one says hello to this one, hello to this one, hello to this one. So a friction goes up. And then if friction goes up, the delta P of friction goes up. So they found out that if if they put a parallel line they will just give enough room for the gas to transport okay and will still be no accumulation problems and actually we're going to make a after easter we're going to make a class example working on the snow white case okay and then comes the last and the fancy part that all of you maybe like that is um, subsea boosting and compression okay i put something a machine to actually to give energy to the fluid to transport it further to where it needs to be carried, okay? <clears throat> and I think I have uh, some slides, some... 
Oh, <laughs> we had some leftovers from pumps. We are not done yet. Sorry. Let's create one space here. But these were some questions that you, some of you made. So I think it's a bit. Okay, uh, so these two, I think these two pictures are important because they have to do with the uh, uh, multi-phase compression and pumping, okay? This is, I think I, we talked last class, this is for a high GBF application. Okay, and this is for low GBF application. Okay, and by high GBF I'm saying GBF less than 30%, okay? And that's low GBF, typically less than 10%. Okay, and you see that actually um, uh, the passage of the fluid is goes is called a, a mixed impeller. Okay, because axial it goes like that, and radial it goes like that. Okay, this is radial. So this is mixed because it's something in between axial and and radio. I had another picture also. Some people were asking how the the power cable reaches to the to the um, to the pump. Okay. And uh, here is a picture of the wellhead. Actually, the wellhead has a hole. Okay, that is uh, called a penetrator. You have here a cross section. That is still keeping uh, keeping sealing, okay? They won't allow. Um, it will still keep the integrity of the wellhead, okay? But it will allow to pass the cable through the wellhead, and that's I think this is how it looks like in a cross section. And I have another picture showing, um, yeah, how it looks like from outside. I think we had this picture also from Rubiales. I think I showed you last class. Sorry about it, I forgot completely about this. Okay, so when going back to, um, okay, going back to uh, subsea boosting and compression, one approach is if I have my wells, okay, and I want to transport those fluids all the way to, let's say, I have a platform. Or also some other approaches that I have here shore, okay? Or I have an FPSO, okay? I can put the pump, usually I try to put it as close as possible to the source, okay? Because that's where it's most effective. Because here is where I'm going to have the problems. It's like the, the pressure at the suction that goes down very much in the ESP, okay? If I put the pump as close as possible to the formation, I won't have that issue. It will be the same thing here. So I try to put the pumping module, the multi-phase boosting, okay? And boosting is just a word that can be either pumping for mostly liquids or either compression for mostly gas. And then I can transport it either to a pl platform, either to FPSO, or maybe a long transportation distance, like in Snow White, all the way to shore, okay? Some uh, limitations here are um, uh, the power transportation distance, okay? We remember these pumps, they have to run with something. These boosters, they have to run. So th they have to be fed with something. So one limitation is uh, power transportation okay I'm not sure exactly about the limits but it's something close to 80 kilometers so if I have completely offshore okay this is called this approach is called subsea to bed 
to subset to beach. Okay. This distance nowadays it cannot be greater than uh, 80 kilometers because that's the limitation for power transportation on in the line. Okay. Um, also, one limitation with subsea boosters is that we have different boosters depending on how is the GBF, how much gas do I have. Okay, so I have these are single phase pumps. Okay, that they are good for a very low GBF. Okay, they are mostly liquid, but they give you a very big high boosting up to 250 bar but really, really low GBF. Then after that you have for a slightly smaller delta P, but very high, but slightly higher GBF, you have the hybrid pumps that they are not single phase. They have a bit mixed impellers, okay? They have these uh, mixed impellers. Then you have fully multi-phase that they can cover the whole range of GBF, okay? Gas, remember GBF is gas volume fraction. And then at the end, if you have mostly gas, then you have compression, okay? In this case, wet gas compression. Okay. And this is a technology that has been in development for quite some time, but it has a lot of challenges and is expensive. So also one approach that the industry is maybe testing now is saying, okay, we want to use just a normal single liquid pump and a normal single gas uh, single gas compressor but i will put now a separation module before okay on the stream coming from the wells i will put a separation and then i will pump and compress separately and i and then i will take separately these two to shore or i will mix them and take them on the same pipe to shore okay so this is another uh, actually there are not many i think there are not any installation but the industry is also aiming for that in the future, okay? To do a subsea separation plus a single phase boosting. Okay, before we conclude, any questions? Comments? Someone wants to sing? No? So just to summarize, so we have finished with the ESP topic. It was a bit complex, but I recommend really to, if you can go to this exercise and try to do it yourself for the other years and you understand, I, I guess, I, I think that you will understand properly the topic if you practice by yourself, okay? Watching, re-watching the video. Work in the meantime on the exercise four. I, I recommend also that if you can finish it before Easter, I think it's possible to do it, okay? And then you have a happy Easter and you don't have to worry about this exercise. Um, <coughs> okay, and then for next, next after Easter, we're going to talk about a compression, okay? That is a bit similar to multi-phase boosting, but not exactly, but we are going to see what are the details about compression that we have to take into account. Then we are going to talk about optimization and we will see if there is time to see uh, some uh, marine dynamics, okay? But uh, I'm not sure. I think maybe not. And then we just conclude the the course, okay? So enjoy the Easter and yeah, good luck.